to build a rocket of the size needed and within the Kremlin's deadline of beating the Americans was a challenge beyond any the chief designer had previously undertaken. Karaliov quickly realized they would need new, vastly more powerful engines for the huge new rocket. But Karaliov did not see eye to eye with his usual manufacturer on the kind of engines the new rocket would need. He had no choice but to find an alternative supplier. Karolyov was forced to go to an aircraft designer named Kuznetsov in Samar. This is a fellow who had, who had designed very good aircraft engines, but that was all the experience he had. That was a big risk for Karolyov. Kuznetsov had built up a formidable reputation as a jet engineer, having designed the engines for the first Soviet long-range strategic bomber. But he had never worked with rocket engines. Kuznetsov did not have any experience in building liquid propellant engines, but when he looked at their configuration, he saw that liquid propellant engines, rocket engines, did not pose any more problems than aircraft engines and realized that this challenge could be solved. Valentin and Izimov had worked under Kuznetsov on jet engine design, but when the chance came in 1962 to apply his skills to rocket engineering, he seized it. From the Kuznetsov Design Bureau in Samara, on the banks of the Volga River, 1,000 kilometers from Moscow, the team began working out what kind of engines the colossal new moon rocket would need. The basic design of rocket engines is simple. Oxygen and fuel are pumped separately at very high pressures into the beating heart of the engine, the combustion chamber, where they are ignited, propelling the rocket forwards. The higher the combustion chamber pressure, the higher the performance of the engine. Those very high pressures are built up by pumps driven by a gas turbine fired from the pre-burner, a mini combustion chamber that draws off part of the oxygen and fuel supply. Faced with the deadline of beating the United States, it became obvious to Karaliov there wouldn't be the time to develop the kind of gargantuan engines needed for the new rocket, christened the N-1. With Russia lacking the kind of industrial infrastructure of the Americans, there would only be time to make small but highly efficient engines for the N-1 rocket, a total of 30 for the rocket's first stage. In order to lift off, you have to have more thrust than, than the gravitational force holding you down. And in our case, we decided to go with five engines to do that, provide that thrust. And in the case of the Russians, they used 30 engines. So they used engines that were about a sixth the thrust level of our Saturn V engines. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a matter of engineering choice which way you went. But the choice to have 30 engines was one that was forced on Karaliov by Russia's lack of resources. With so many engines, the chances of any one failing would massively increase. To overcome those huge odds and achieve the efficiency and performance Karaliov demanded, the engine designers would have to crack a problem that had always been shied away from as too difficult and too dangerous. At that time, all American and Russian rocket engines worked using an open cycle in which the exhaust products from the pre-burner that drives the pumps are dumped over the side. A simple but wasteful design. But for the high performance engines Karaliov demanded, that inefficiency was unacceptable. Russia's engine designers would have no choice but to take an untried and highly risky step. 
they would have to close the cycle and find a way of safely channeling the exhaust products from the pre-burner back into the combustion chamber to be refired. A potentially explosive process, but one that can boost the lifting power of the rocket by 25%. Closed cycle engines require a much better understanding of the combustion process and a much better control of all of the uh, stages in that combustion process. As a consequence, you can blow up a lot of engines trying to build one that works. And I think that the Russians did blow up quite a lot of engines. Mastering the new closed cycle technology with their experimental test-based approach would take time. Time the Russians lacked in their race to beat America to the moon. Not everything went badly. The Bureau's experience with jet engines gave it a lateral and innovative approach to rocket engine development. The Kuznetsov team realized there were strong similarities between the turbo pump assemblies in jet engines and rocket motors. In the construction of both airplane engines and rocket engines, there is a battle to keep the weight down. In our design, the booster pumps are inside the main pumps. This dramatically reduces the external piping, improves reliability, and decreases weight. The compactness of the engine was both original and highly elegant. Well, this design was really a radical design for the early 1960s. Whenever you're designing uh, engines, you want to make it as simple as you can with the minimal amount of parts. So the Russians have typically chosen the single shaft type design for the turbo machinery, which really simplifies and adds to its efficiency and performance. By 1966, with the key technical challenges behind closing the cycle resolved, the highly efficient engine the chief designer had asked for was within sight. But the project was then struck a devastating blow. During routine surgery in January 1966, Karaliov died. The one figure with the authority and vision to galvanize the system behind the goal of beating the Americans had gone. As the N1 rocket finally started to make its way out to the pad at the Cosmodrome, the odds stacking up against Russia in the race to the moon looked formidable. By 1967, the first N1 moon rocket had been assembled at the Cosmodrome. Standing 35 stories high, and weighing the same as 400 double-decker buses, Russia's answer to America's Saturn V presented an awesome sight. I have to say that prior to every launch during those years, we felt a certain trepidation. We were still affected by the large number of accidents that we had witnessed with our own eyes, pretty much since 1947. Vasily Mishin had been appointed to take over as chief designer in the wake of Karaliov's death, in charge of the 24-hour shifts, working to prepare the rocket for launch. Russia lacked the huge facilities needed to ground test all 30 N1 engines as a whole. The first launch would take place with the rocket and its system of closed cycle engines still untried. There would be no alternative but to finalize the design in the same way that all other Russian rockets had been perfected, 